Welcome to Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75, a series by the Planetary Podcast. In Common Home Conversations, you will hear from leading global experts on how the proposal of recognizing the existence of an intangible global common without borders can change our relationship with our planet. The Common Home of Humanity has proposed an ambitious new global pact for the environment. The adverse effects of climate change span across borders and beyond territories. Recognizing the Earth system as a common heritage of humankind is the first step in restoring a stable climate, a visible manifestation of a well-functioning Earth system. This proposal's cascading effects would be systemic and tremendously impact international relations and economics, opening the doors to restoring a well-functioning Earth system. Common Home Conversations is the place to discuss a new social contract between society, economy, and the Earth system. Now, here is your host, founder and CEO of the Planetary Press, Kimberly White. Hello, and welcome to Common Home Conversations. Today, we are joined by Viriato Sormeno Marquez, Professor of Political Philosophy, Philosophy of Nature, and European Ideas at the University of Lisbon. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Kimberly, for having me in this podcast. So you teach political philosophy, philosophy of nature, and European ideas at the University of Lisbon, and you were also one of the authors of the Portuguese Strategy for Sustainable Development. Can you tell us more about these experiences? Well, I think that uh, probably the most important thing that I can tell about my own experience is uh, how I feel so overwhelmed Looking back to the 70s, when I started to be deeply engaged with the environmental movement, with the NGOs in Portugal, in Europe, uh, I think that when I went back 40 years, almost 50 years, I, I am overwhelmed to see that we live now in a rather different planet. It's an amazing experience, um, not in the positive sense, but it's overwhelming, as I said. Because if we look to the state of our planet, not just in terms of uh, climate change, but also in terms of biodiversity and many other features of the environment, we understand that we are in a race, a race against time, uh, a race between the problems that we are creating uh, with our clumsy way of uh, dwelling in, uh, in this planet and the severe difficulties that we are facing in order to solve the problems that we are creating. So what I have done until now um, as a member of NGOs, as a member of advisory bodies, uh, like uh, the Portuguese Council on Environmental, the European Council on uh, uh, Environmental that uh, reunites many organizations in different European countries, as a member of the high um, level group of energy and climate change in the way to COP15. It was a, a group assembled around the president of the European Commission and also giving advice to some foundations like the Gulbenkian Foundation that recently awarded the Gulbenkian Prize for Humanity to Greta Thunberg. What I'm trying to do with my activities basically is to give a contribution to try to cope with the problems that we are doing as a collective, as humanity. Because I think that we need public policies but we need to overcome a very narrow understanding of what is at stake with environment and climate crisis. If we think that this problem is a problem to be solved just by governments and states and big corporations, I think we are wrong. Because on the root of this problem, we have the need of a profound shift, uh, transformation in our set of values, in our vision of the world. And in order to do that, to perform that, I think that we need the contribution also of culture, of ethics, of religion. So we are all actors in this fight for the continuation and the survival of human civilization on Earth. 
One of the insights that uh, very soon I tried to systematize in my writings was to define what is environmental crisis. Let me clarify that when I speak of climate change, I consider climate change not as something that exists per se, but as part, as a, a chapter, as a dimension of environmental crisis. So looking to an environmental crisis, I think that we may identify five dimensions or five features, five characteristics that are completely unique. First, environmental crisis with climate, of course, inside it is the only really planetary crisis. There is no other thing with such scope. We may see that, for instance, climate change is basically or intensively felt on the extreme north and extreme south of the, our planet in regions in which there is almost anybody living. So it's completely planetary. There, is, there are no sanctuary. Secondly, it's a irreversibility and entropic crisis. We know that we have the massive biodiversity extinction. And when a species disappears, is, is forever. So it's irreversible. There is also another, a third dimension is the cumulative acceleration. We are indeed in a process of great acceleration uh, inside what is now called the Anthropocene. And uh, what is happening, uh, for instance, with the oceans, uh, the ocean acidification is a good example of the speedy cumulative acceleration we are embarked. In a fourth characteristic, uh, there is a, a growing political and social unrest. We know that many conflicts now inside countries and between countries have also uh, the mark, have also the sign of environmental crisis. Probably the Arab Spring could never happen without the climate change impact. And finally, something that probably we'll uh, speak uh, later in our conversation, we are creating a, a kind of what I call the ontological depth between generations. So we are transmitting to the coming generations a depth, not in terms of money, of capital, but a depth in terms of the harm we are doing to the planet, to, to the software of the planet, to the biosphere, to the atmosphere, to the hydrosphere. So we are jeopardizing uh, the planet. And so we are transmitting a kind of ontological debt to be paid by the coming generations. Now, that's really interesting. And diving back further into some of these challenges of the environmental crisis that we're currently in, in the book Security at a Crossroad, New Tools for New Challenges, you highlight the seven categories of human security. Can you elaborate on these? And in your view, what are some of the challenges climate change poses to human security? Yeah, with pleasure. Well, when we speak normally about security, we think immediately in terms of strategy, in terms of military security, military balance. That, that's a wrong conception. It's an old one. In the past, uh, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, it was uh, logical to think in that way. Today is completely not just out of fashion, but completely wrong. Indeed, we had in, in 1994, the United Nations Development Program in a report that was published that year, 94, advanced with a more comprehensive uh, concept of human security, uh, trying to look to security also and basically from the perspective of the individual of the person, of ourselves. So what do we as citizens of our countries, as citizens of the world, what are for us the main dimensions and features of security? And the seven categories that you mentioned are part of that vision uh, of uh, transforming the paradigm of security. They are basically the following, so economic security, that's completely important in a world that is growing to have more jobless people on account of the pandemic situation. 
Economic security is also a key dimension. Food security, health security, other two very important dimensions. And environmental security. Well, I would say that environmental security is hierarchical because it entails also those that I mentioned. Personal security, to be at his uh, as individual, to feel safe no matter your race, your sexual orientation, your level of material wealth. Community security, to live in a, a safe community, and political security. I think those seven dimensions, as I mentioned in, in the chapter you referred, are, in my opinion, very connected with the big contribution of uh, one, probably the most famous or the most important uh, American president ever, uh, I mean, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that in the famous speech of the State of the Union, 1941, spoke about the need to have at global level, not just at the level of the United States, at global level, four freedoms. And those four freedoms, as probably many of our listeners know by heart, are freedom of speech and expression, freedom of religion, uh, in the words of Roosevelt, freedom of every person to worship God, freedom from want. Freedom for, from want means that we are secure in terms of our access to material wealth. So we have access to food, we have a job. So it has to do with the economic realm. And finally, freedom from, from fear, meaning that we live in a safe world, that a world that is not going to be disturbed by invasions, by warfare. Uh, I think that the table proposed in 1994 by UNEP is very harmonic, is harmonious, and goes in the roots of the proposal of uh, uh, President Roosevelt in the way that it is intended uh, not for a particular community, a particular a specific country, but is intended for the world as a whole, using the expression of Roosevelt everywhere in the world. So the idea to have uh, an international system, not just international law, but international system that is able to assure the implementation of those dimensions of security. And uh, of course, if we look to climate change, if we look to environmental crisis, what do we see? We see that all those dimensions are in peril, are uh, jeopardized, are in danger. Let me give you an example. I was shocked this summer. I was working in September uh, and suddenly I realized that the big fires in the, in the American West namely in the state of Oregon, uh, a very beautiful state that I already traveled uh, some years ago. Oregon is a state with, with a few, uh, more or less 5 million inhabitants. And I was told that 500,000 Americans, inhabitants of the state of Oregon, were on the move, running from the huge fires that were uh, crossing uh, the states, many, many other states, but the state of Oregon was very hit by those big fires. Those big fires started, historically speaking, starting in the summer of 2017 in Portugal. We had two major big fires. One of them in October 2017 was one of the severe and uh, damaging recorded in history. And those fires had a direct connection with climate change. So we are not speaking about a matter of natural sciences. We are, we are speaking about the way in which we can cope in our society and the way in which we can look forward into the future. That is the, the, the question is about the future. The question is about security. The question is about the 
the continuation of our life on Earth. We have to shift dramatically uh, the way in which we are inhabiting the Earth. Our way of dwelling on the Earth must be profoundly shifted. Absolutely. And I know that there are many who view climate change as a threat multiplier, as it can potentially exacerbate many of the current challenges and threats that members of our global community are facing, such as food insecurity and infectious diseases. The former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon had stated that climate change would not only exacerbate these existing threats to peace and security, but climate change is also itself a threat to peace and security. So it's kind of a driver of both things. And as we see, these cascading effects of climate change continue to impact our natural resources. It will continue to drive and amplify conflict. And we've seen this begin to happen in some developing nations that have had a lessened capacity for climate change adaptation, for sure. Yeah, for sure. When we look to the tipping points that you have mentioned, and Ban Ki-moon also uh, referred uh, when he was uh, the United Nations uh, General Secretary, we need not just to limit the tipping points to certain areas and to the borders of developing countries, because um, even in European countries like Portugal, in very developed countries, in the leading country like the United States, we are facing the consequences of climate change. Uh, The big fires in Australia, in Sweden, in Russia, are the examples of those uh, cascading effects. And, um, of course, we are seeing the tipping points in the Arctic, in the Coral Reef in Australia. But probably, probably, and I'm not the first one to say that probably even the coronavirus crisis we are facing now has to do with the extinction and the loss of biodiversity. So we are invading as a species the habitats of many other species. So we are breaking the borders between our species and other other animal species on the earth. We are cutting the uh, self-defense mechanisms uh, between our species and probably what happened, uh, and not just with the coronavirus, with COVID-19, but with other uh, illnesses that uh, appeared uh, also in the in a zoonotic process so the transmission of biological material in this case of virus from animals to humans to our uh, to humanity is probably the result of a tipping point in biodiversity so that's not a very bold thesis uh, if we look into the literature uh, of the speciality uh, probably you will find many other uh, authors and many other uh, really specialists that will tell you the same. So we need indeed to consider that uh, climate change is part of a, a global crisis, that's the, the environmental crisis, and we need to find uh, a new international system because today we are completely adrift. I would say that in terms of international law and in terms of international system, we are uh, probably in the 19th century. So, as we know, uh, we had two major steps forward in the international system. The first one was the President Wilson idea of creating the League of Nations. Uh, and uh, the second one wa- was the creation uh, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, and, uh, and many others of the United Nations. But today, the United Nations is a pale image of what was in the 45 to 50, is a pale e- e- image of the need we have of a strong, active uh, international organization and of course, of course, I'm not blaming <laughs> the current uh, General Secretary of the United Nations because it's not a matter to be blamed for a personality. It's a matter of organization, of involvement of countries. Above all, it's a matter of the big countries, United States, China, European Union, India, Russia. So those big acting countries need to go back to the original spirit of 
the Charter of the United Nations and need to cross that spirit with the new challenges we have. Because today the world, it is much dangerous than in 45, because we have existential problems, climate change, global environmental crisis, the risk of nuclear war. There was already in, in 1945, but today it is bigger. We have also the problem, the economic system. We are now very fragile because we are exposed as human humanity. We are very much exposed to cyclical finance and economic crisis because we, we failed in the building of a system able to control the finance and economic flows. Contrary to the hopes of, of President Roosevelt, Roosevelt considered uh, the need to have an economic order. He even considered the need, he wrote to the Congress, uh, saying that we need to have an economic bill of rights. So it's interesting. Many, many people in Europe don't know that President Roosevelt considered that one of the tasks for the future of the United States was to have a second Bill of Rights of economic dimension. So environmental crisis can't be separated uh, from economic crisis because it's the economic structure, the economic fabric of the world is the key driver of uh, the planet, of humanity today. If we don't shift the economic fabric, we will not be able to tackle the environmental and climate crisis. Absolutely. And we can no longer look at climate change as an issue that might affect us down the road. It's a very real and current ongoing threat. And going back to what you were saying about the current pandemic, it has been said by many experts that this is the result of environmental degradation and human encroachment into natural spaces, and not just with COVID, as you said. For example, the wildlife trade has been linked to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, as well as several other major pandemics and epidemics throughout the years, including MERS, SARS, and Ebola, and also the transmission of pathogens such as bird flu and swine flu. Mm -hmm. According to the World Medical Organization, 75% of the new diseases that appeared in the last 40 years are uh, zoonotic uh, diseases. So, uh, diseases that are based on the transmission of uh, biologic material from other species to human species. The link, the linkage, the connection, uh, probably the causal connection between biodiversity loss and uh, these new diseases seem to me uh, very, very strong. Definitely. It's a concerning statistic and it should be a wake-up call that we really need to be respectful of these natural environments and these ecosystems that we share on our planet. Now, diving into my next question, you have said that we need to abide by the moral and political imperative of fighting against climate change if we want to be fair toward our children and grandchildren. Do we have a moral obligation to work toward intergenerational equity, safeguarding future generations, and helping to ensure a stable climate? And how can the Global Pact for the Environment and the framework proposed by the Common Home of Humanity help us to achieve this? A very, very important question, Kimberly. Well, let me start by the first question, a more philosophical question. Uh, uh, are we uh, obliged? Do we have uh, obligations towards the coming generations? That are, uh, are there duties between generations? I think that it's a very important philosophical and ethical question. And uh, in my opinion, the, that debate is typically a debate that could be possible only in very, um, let's say, refined, sophisticated civilizations. So uh, the debate in the West about that started again uh, between two major American politicians. Uh, the first time uh, ever that the, the question of uh, justice between generations was raised was in 1789. We can find that in the exchange of letters between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Thomas Jefferson was in 1789 in Paris. He had been during five years ambassador, minister, as the, it was the, the, the term used in the 18th century, minister of the new United States in, in Paris. 
and he was almost coming back, uh, it was in September 89, and he wrote to James Madison in the United States saying, I want to discuss with you a new problem, the problem of our duties regarding the next generation. So it's amazing how strong and how useful for the debate of today, uh, the discussion between Madison and Jefferson is. They discuss two topics, the topic of public debt and the topic of the revision of the Constitution. So basically, the thesis of uh, Jefferson was that uh, a generation should not force or connect the next generation, the coming generation, neither to a big burden of uh, monetary debt, public debt, nor to a constitution that could not be revised. Uh, Jefferson was not very glad he was not in the Philadelphia Convention because he was in Paris, but he was exchanging uh, opinions by mail with Madison and others, and he was not glad with the solution uh, for the revision that was found uh, during by the drafters of the federal American constitution. He, he preferred a more stable mechanism of uh, revision every 19 years. Uh, so he was trying to, to, to say that we, a generation, must left the way open uh, for the next generation. And I'm quoting now what I think can be considered the principle of Jefferson, that is, the, uh, and I'm quoting, the earth belongs in usufruct to the living. It's very clear. Jefferson was saying that we are not owners of the earth. We are just using it during our lifespan of generation. And we have the duty to give back, to transmit the earth in good conditions to the next generation. We don't have an absolute autonomy. We need to care uh, also in the way in which we behave on earth to care for the interests of the coming generation. So we can say that in this line of Jefferson, we have the duty of maintaining and if possible, promoting the earth's integrity for the next generations. And we are not doing that. So that's why and I'm now going to the second part of your question. As we know, the United Nations is involved in a process of uh, creating a global pact for the environment uh, that will be proclaimed in uh, 2022, uh, 50 years after the first uh, big conference of Stockholm, uh, the first big United Nations conference in Stockholm, and uh, also 50 years after the creation of the United Nations Environmental Program. And, uh, well, Common Home of Humanity is trying to not just to support that effort from the United Nations, but we are trying in a certain way to give uh, a kind of uh, an upload to increase the intensity of the change and that's why we are proposing the need to integrate in that Global Pact for the Environment the idea of a, a safe operating space treaty, kind of convention, global convention, that uh, is uh, directed to give a legal status to a very important uh, scientific concept that was created, well, let's say, in the last 50 years by Earth scientists. And uh, that concept is the concept of the Earth system. As we know, we, we have the concept of Earth system in science, but Earth system is not just a um, concept. It's a concept that uh, reflects a reality, and that reality is the living unity of the Earth. Is the fact that our planet is our planet not because it is one of the rocky planets in the solar system. Uh, we have other rocky planets. We have uh, Mars, we have Venus, we have Mercury. Uh, but the Earth system, the Earth planet, is the only planet that, uh, besides the rocky surface, we have 
something mysterious that is responsible for life. We have a, a kind of software, a living software, and that software is responsible for the fact that we are the, until now, the only known uh, planet with intelligent life, not just in our solar system, but at least in our galaxy. And that's a big responsibility we have. So our effort as a group of citizens uh, from different countries is to participate in the debate of the United Nations for the Global Pact for the Environment and to add to that the need to give us a step forward and to create a SOS treaty, a SOS convention, safe operating space uh, convention, in which the international community, the international law, and the international system will find a new way of inhabiting our Earth based on cooperation, compulsory cooperation based not in the current negative sum game we are embarked in which we are decreasing every day we are decreasing the nature of capital we are decreasing the capacity of the earth to support life but on the contrary we should create that convention that will give a legal status that is going to allow for individual states but also for other big international actors and we know that we have companies, corporations that are also big international actors, to have a kind of earth accountability in which we can, in a very rigorous way, in a very independent way, neutral way, we can do the counting of the externalities and we can give a reward for countries and corporations for the positive externalities they introduce in the earth system and, of course, we need to have some kind of penalty for the negative externalities international actors introduce in the planet. So, in a, a nutshell, that's basically what we are intending to do within the United Nations process of uh, creating the Global Pact for the Environment. That's really great. And I feel like historically nations have focused more on the creation or attempted creation of intragenerational equity in terms of development, focusing only on the current generations rather than the future. And I think this is something, and I feel it's apparent with the continued propping up of the fossil fuel industry where we're giving trillions of dollars in subsidies, which is just compounding the issues from the climate crisis. And that's why I feel that initiatives like the proposal from the Common Home of Humanity are so critical to what we need to do to move forward and to safeguard those future generations. Yeah, I agree. I agree entirely. And, um, well, there is also a big transformative dimension in this idea, in this proposal, and uh, the dialogue with uh, members of diplomatic bodies and uh, members of the media, uh, politicians. Uh, it's very interesting because we can't do nothing without sharing values, without learning with others. And uh, I think that the shift from the current pattern of negotiation, diplomatic negotiation, that is basically the burden sharing model, it's for me vital. So the idea that we are discussing quotas for uh, limits for emissions, it's so poor and it's so wrong. Because we need to bring to the table of negotiations much more than that. We need to create a diplomatic paradigm that is able to go from a zero-sum game in which uh, I win what you lose, or the contrary, you win what I lose, to a win-win diplomacy, to a positive-sum game. And in order to do that, I think that the SOS Treaty, the existence of a convention uh, giving a legal status to the Earth system, will give a concrete a material shape to an idea that was uh, created by my dear colleague and friend Paul Magalhães, uh, that Kimberly, you know him as well. Um, and uh, in 2002, Paul Magalhães talked to me about the idea of the Earth condominium. And it is now a very known worldwide idea, the Earth condominium. And basically, the Earth condominium 
could be the prototype for the new brand or the new model of negotiation. Because when we have a home condominium, for instance, a condominium of the place where we, we live with our family, we know that we have two types of property. We have the property of our flat, of our house, but we have also the common property of the common spaces and uh, functions, uh, the electric system, elevators, uh, many other systems that com that are integrated in, in the compound of the condominium are also co-owned by each one of the uh, members of that condominium. So the same should happen in the international system. We are not saying to states that the national sovereignty is going to end. No, that would be false. What we are saying is that if you keep completely connected to the old, with almost four centuries model of state sovereignty, we are going to lose everything, including the state sovereignty. It's what is called the sovereignty paradox. We can tackle climate change, environmental crisis, finance crisis alone. You can tackle pandemics alone. See what happened in Europe. The pandemic was first faced uh, in a very competitive way, but now, just after the cooperation between European countries, now we have the hope of, of overcoming the, the pandemic situation, although the situation, as you know, is now very bad. So, our proposal tries to combine two types of sovereignty. The first one is the classic sovereignty, so the territorial sovereignty of states. You are going to need that sovereignty. For instance, to many functions of a state, you need to have national control, the control of borders, for instance, the control of, of international trade and so on, in certain conditions must be developed by the national state. But if we speak about the atmosphere, if we speak about water, both the ocean water or, or the river, the continental waters, if we speak about the management of biodiversity, the protection of, of forests, we are speaking about the common software, the common heritage, uh, using uh, the category of Arvo Pardo. And so, in that case, we can't divide the management. We, we can't say we are the owners of uh, <laughs> this part of the atmosphere. We can say we are the owners of this part of the ocean. No, we are not the owners. As countries, we will exercise a co-sovereignty. So, a sovereignty of cooperation with our other entities, with our other states. So, it's the, the good example of what I called the compulsory cooperation. If we are really intending to overcome climate crisis, uh, environmental crisis, we need to act together. That's compulsory cooperation. We need to act together, even with countries to which uh, we have many other points of disagreement. But there is no atmosphere for shining for the United States. We have just the Earth's atmosphere. So we need to translate that in political language, in law language. But I think that it's not very complex from the point of view of Earth sciences and with all the tools we have now, we, with the capacity of uh, data analysis we have, I think it's very strong, the argument. The demonstration of the reality of these uh, theses, of these uh, physical and uh, geophysical and biogeophysical and chemical situation is very strong in terms of demonstration. And we need to jump from the field of sciences to the field of the real world of citizens' engagement, of political engagement of, of states to the field of uh, international law uh, and international diplomacy and international politics. I think that's the, the task we have in the face of us. Absolutely. You make some really excellent points there. And I think you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I want to dive into it a little bit more, which is the current legal status of climate change as a common concern of humankind that results in mitigating potential damages from climate change and it was a dominant consideration for much of the UNFCCC's existence, creating a burden-sharing system. 
These mechanisms represent a negative sum game where the stable climate resource continually decreases. How can recognizing climate as a common heritage be the legal innovation we need in climate negotiations after decades of underwhelming climate talks? Th- that's precisely the point I raised about the need to have uh, the um, acknowledgement of the Earth system, to give the Earth system a legal status. Understanding that there is uh, an object, although intangible, but no matter, an object that needs legal protection and that the legal protection of the Earth system can't be done just by uh, an institution nor just by one state or a corporation, but it's a common task of humankind and the human international system and the international community, just by that uh, we'll be able to indeed overcome the obstacle of the low protection or the low status of climate change as a common concern. This is not a common concern. This is indeed a menace, a danger, a threat to the common heritage of humankind, because climate change is the result of the disarray of the flows of our way of life, our way of inhabiting the earth, and of the way we are ill-managing the earth system. So the only way to have a concrete strategy, a coordinated strategy, a long-run strategy of countries and other entities to face and to overcome, to mitigate and to adapt to climate change is to understand that climate change is a symptom of environmental crisis. And and environmental crisis is also a symptom of the bad shape and bad status and the disarray status in which uh, the Earth system now is passing. So uh, we need to combine and to connect the climate change with the need of uh, restoring the Earth system. And um, when I say restoring, I am saying that we need to shift also the economic fabric, because now we have an economic fabric based on what we may call the entropic value. In uh, Today, the economic value is the, econ- the value of entropic processes, meaning when the normal example that is easy to, to explain is you have a forest, okay? A forest is a very strong part of the Earth system because it uh, produces uh, a set of Natural service is very important. Namely, it is also a way of capturing CO2. So it is a good tool to fight climate change, but it's also very important to the water cycle. It's very important to the forest, to the biodiversity. However, in economic value, the forest only uh, gains economic value when it's destroyed. Look to what is happening, for instance, in the Amazon forest, in the big Amazon forest, a huge uh, natural area still pristine in many regions, is being destroyed. Why? Because there are actors uh, interested in making narrow, uh, rapid uh, economic value from something that is so, so rich, so powerful, and so everlasting. So we need, within this effort, to have a legal status for the Earth system, we need also not just to shift our diplomacy, our international system, but we need to shift our economic mindset. We need to give a price not to the the destruction of natural resources, not to the the destruction of the Earth system, but to give a price, to give a monetary reward to the preservation to the protection, to the promotion, and to the restoring of the different areas of the Earth system. Water, biodiversity, forests, landscapes. Uh, The beauty of landscapes is also a natural value. One of the things that keep us connected with our planet is the experience of beauty. The static values are also part of the reason why it's so important to be alive and it's so so fantastic to be alive. 
we are not just destroying the life carrying capacity of our planet, but we are also destroying the beauty of the planet. And that's a shame. And we need to face that with all the intelligence, imagination, and moral strengths that we can assemble. All right, and there you have it. We cannot tackle climate change, the environmental crisis, the financial crisis, or the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic alone. We need to act together, despite other points of disagreement. We are not the owners of this earth, we are just using it during our lifetime. And we have an obligation to work toward intergenerational equity and promote the Earth's integrity for future generations. That is all for today, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75. Please subscribe, share, and be sure to tune in on February 10th to continue the conversation with our special guest, Katherine Richardson, renowned climate change expert, professor in biological oceanography, and leader of the Sustainability Science Center at the University of Copenhagen and visit us at www.theplanetarypress.com for more episodes and the latest news in sustainability, climate change, and the environment.